Hello, welcome to another episode of Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudum Somi. Today I'm speaking to one of our great minds in South Africa. His name is Abdullah Verashia. He is the CEO of The Strategist. Abdullah, how are you? I'm good in you, Dudu. I'm glad you pronounced my surname in a very foreign, very interesting, very unique way. Uh, I'm going to talk <laughs> a lot from now on. <laughs> what should I have said? Uh, it's known as Varachia, but it doesn't sound as cool and as, and as uh, funky as the way you put it across. So I, I'm happy with Varachia. <laughs> oh, I can't win. Uh, I do like your surname, though. Whatever. What does it mean? Is there a translation? Well, I have no idea. I went to the Rand Easter show that I think all of us are familiar with uh, today a few years ago when I looked at genealogy and looked at the history of it. And I was told that it's got Italian heritage. Uh, so I tend to use yeah. that uh, as, as as my uh, claim to fame. But unfortunately, it's not. Uh, I don't know where the heritage and where it comes from. But we've got many Varashas in South Africa. It's so great to chat to you. I mean, most of the time we are talking in the context of the business school um, but when I try and look at a adults, I always try and figure out, I wonder what they were like as kids. <laughs> and I'm wondering, what were your fun times? What did you do? What were your pastimes as a child? Sure. I think I grew up in the cool city of Emalasheni, which is, uh, which is previously known as Whitbank. Uh, I uh, grew up with a lot of smog in my systems. And so I think my lungs probably function at 50% due to, but it was, it was bliss. It was beautiful growing up and, because of the Group Areas Act and because of the impact of apartheid, my grandfather and grandmother used to live on what today is probably the town of Woodbank. It was probably uh, the space and the spot where their home was. And they had hectares and hectares of land is where the pick and pace is today. And they got forcibly evicted in 1978 from there. And we were then placed into a township in South Africa called Linville. And uh, it's the exact place where Jackson and Tembu grew up. And we were very close to Jackson and Tembu and many of the... Oh other yeah. political activist, And so his death was particularly difficult for us as a family. Uh, so we grew up in, uh, in Linville, which was this township. And I say bliss because uh, growing up there gave me the opportunity to do a few things. One, to love football. I used to grow up playing football mm -hmm. from the morning until the evening. I used to go every Saturday to the stadium to watch Whitbank Black Aces. And I became, and my family became familiar faces there. I grew yeah. up uh, eating millies on the braai, which is fantastic. And so for me, it's this warm uh, growing up in a community that essentially was a foundation to an extent in terms of where we are. So I grew up there and then I went to high school out in Nelspreet to where my uncle, who was involved quite actively in the struggle, uh, ended up working in the Pumalanga provincial government. And so I went to school in Nelspreet. So that was my upbringing. That was my youth. And what vision did you have for your life? I mean, growing up and is the life you're living anything you envision? Yeah, it's a fascinating question. Uh, if you had to ask me at the age of 21, uh, would I be living the life that I'm living at the moment? I'd say to you, I didn't know that a life like this, like this exists. So it's not like I had this predetermined plan and I had a vision and I had an agenda and I had an objective in terms of where I'd like to go to. I often say that we have some seminal moments in our life that happen to come to us at a particular time. I think it's almost, I think it's always divine. Uh, it comes mm. at a particular time and it requires agency to be able to take it up. And for me, there were two or three particularly interesting inflection points in terms of my life. The one inflection point that to a large extent has dominated and impacted a lot of my career was a decision that I took, uh, not by design, but by default when I was in grade 11. Uh, in your days, today it will be called standard nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Standard nine form, I don't know what. Uh, but I was sitting in the bush. Uh, I was in the school in Nelspreet, and we used to go for a leadership camp out into the bush. And so in any event, you would go for five days with all of the people in your class for a leadership camp to learn about leadership in the bush. And so my principal came to us, I'll never forget, with a piece of paper saying that there's a United Nations debate that's taking place. And uh, the school has been invited to participate in the Mpumalanga provincial competition. And if you win there, you go to nationals. And if you win there, you go to New York and represent South Africa. And so he said, who's interested in debating and uh, participating in this United Nations debate? And we all kept quiet. And I'll never forget, after a stony silence of about two minutes, I looked at the guy next to me. Uh, it was a guy, Sakani Mufukeng. And I said, Sakani, 
do you know if we do this, we'll get the day of school? <laughs> and so we picked our hands up and we did it. And that decision in the bush, uh, framed by my desire to have a day of school, impacted so much of my life. What happened was I went to Cape Town. I won uh, the prize uh, to go and be one of the 12 people to represent South Africa at the UN. I'd never flown in my life. I'd never debated in my life. And my first flight now happened to be to go to New York City, which was obviously mind-blowing for a 17-year-old who had never left the country in his life. And so I went to New York and won this global conference as the best speaker, and then came back. And that decision, to a large extent, one, uh, opened up my social awareness, my view that I'd like to speak in public, which I never knew was possible. It opened up uh, the uh, meeting point with a very dear friend and colleague, Ms. Mr. Wabisa Mayema, and the two of us, when we went to university, opened up an organization called the Collective Genius that grew significantly and ended up doing youth development programs for most of the leading companies in South Africa. We've done some fascinating programs. Uh, that decision uh, introduced me to a tutor, Sudeshan Reddy, who works at the UN. And in 2007, I ended up studying, I ended up becoming a lawyer. So I ended up studying law and became a lawyer. And after two years of working at one of the big law firms, I realized it's just not working for me. And so I went to that model UN tutor, Sudeshan Reddy, and I said to him, Sudeshan, I need some advice. And he connected me with, with a friend of his, Martin Davis, Dr. Martin Davis, who then opened up a advice, corporate advisory and strategy firm. And I became a partner there. Martin introduced me to Brock Nick Adele, and I teach at Gibbs. And so wow. I'm trying to relay a picture yeah. of how one decision has such a catapulting effect in so many parts of your life. That is an amazing journey, and I hope people are inspired and are aware and present that uh, sometimes just like trying to get out of something can bring you into this amazing life. Um, but what is truly important in, in uh, what's truly important in life for you? Uh, you know, you ask the question, would I have imagined what I do at the moment? And so I've got what we call a portfolio career, right? So I I'm involved in four or five different things. The one is I teach at uh, the business school Gibbs, which is a home and a heart for me. I teach in the area of strategy and innovation, and I also look after the Harvard program at the school. And it's been a privilege to work under the leadership of Professor Nick Bernadel, Prof. Nicola Klein, and Dr. Morrison Tombeni. It's been a privilege because, uh, you know, I think I love, and it's a passion point to stand in front of a classroom, to be able to teach, to engage, to connect, to interact, to bring together learnings. Uh, to be able to facilitate discussion. And so that's one part of what I do. I also run the strategy and innovation firm called The Strategist, and we do a lot of strategy work for different companies, and it's mutually reinforcing. My strategy work feeds into the classroom, my work into the classroom, and my research there feeds into my strategy work, and so it's a beautiful yeah. symbiosis. And then I sit on a few boards of different companies, and so the question or the point is, if I think of what's important to me as an individual, it's this ability to say with the privilege that I've had and the ability to do the work that I do, uh, how can I in some way have a small impact in terms of the society that I live in? And for me, it's always interesting, sometimes difficult, but sometimes exciting, sometimes frightening, but sometimes really interesting to be able to live in the society that we live in. I think we've got a very painful past. And my difficulty and something that I often grapple with is that we haven't really taken the opportunity to understand this past to tell our stories, to be able to reflect on uh, how we have come to be where we are today. And so often I, I say that we end up in a workplace or we end up in a corporate environment or we end up in a party or in an event and we put up a facade in terms of what is socially acceptable. And so for me, part of this is being able to say, what is the South African narrative? What are our collective contributions that we need to bring to bear? And more importantly, can we have the tough but necessary conversations? And so it's a privilege to do some of the work because at least we can in some way open the vehicles for these conversation points and to bring people together. And I often say that if we can imagine better, then we can do better. And so part yeah. of this is to be able to say, how do we imagine new possibilities and how do we then collectively build that together? You did mention that you studied law and then you went and did a master's in commerce. What has that training as a lawyer contributed to you as a strategist? Sure. I think it's a fascinating question, Dudu. I, I didn't start off, uh, you know, wanting to become a lawyer. I ended up in grade 12, grade 11, deciding, and this is important for young people listening, uh, not knowing what I needed to do. Uh, my decision was framed by watching very cool series at the time. 
it wasn't suits back in my day. I don't know what it was, but it was, I think, LA Law or something like that, or Ellie McBeal. And I thought, yeah. wow, the suits are cool. The buildings are cool. The <laughs> coffee looks great. Why don't I become a lawyer and fight cases? And so I became this lawyer. But what is also important is when I got to my first year of university, I didn't actually have a finance to be able to fund my studies. My family was going through a period where the businesses that we were in had gone down. And so I went to university had, having borrowed my registration fees and then realized that I'm not going to survive in this big, interesting, difficult, uh, and overwhelming city of Johannesburg studying law. And so I then started looking for a job and eventually found a job to be a sales representative for one of the mobile phone companies. Oh, Effectively, wow. I was selling recharge vouchers. I would pick up recharge vouchers, uh, put a markup and get them delivered to quick shops and filling stations and supermarkets. And I would do this mostly in Pumalanga. And uh, I never really attended class in many of those days. I was what we would call today winging it. I was just surviving. I was the student who was getting the 50 odd percent to be able to get through in my first two years not because I wasn't studying, but because I never yeah. could attend class. And so in effect, uh, for my first two and a half years, I did that. And I'll never forget, I, uh, on one day, uh, had to go and pick up uh, recharge vouchers to the value of 276,400 Rand. Picked it up, went to a, 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 a takeaway environment to buy some food for lunch before I headed out to Malanga to deliver them. And somebody broke into my car and all of these vouchers were stolen. Oh my. And I went back to my sales manager and I said, look, this is what happened. I was 21, young, naive. And I thought, no, it's fine. He'll, he'll refund me. And he said, no, Abdullah, if you read your contract, you're responsible once you leave the campus. And oh my, my life God. came to an, a crashing, right? I, I then eventually got blacklisted. I got uh, excluded from university. But I felt too embarrassed to go back home and tell my parents, that this is what happened and I've been excluded. And so I then uh, survived in Joburg, but wasn't a student in effect. But because of my UN experience, I happened to be on the SRC. The activism got me involved in the Student Representative Council. And I'll never forget the day when the Dean of Students, Professor De Yaha, called me on my mobile phone and said, Abdullah, I need to see you urgently. He said, uh, I said to him, Prof, you don't just phone me on my phone and make an appointment. You know, as SRC students, we've got to show an image. Yeah. <laughs> I said, do you make an appointment, uh, Prof? He says, no, Abdullah, I need to see you. This is serious. I said, I'm going to raise this for the vice chancellor and the chair of the SRC, Zanele Bakyashi. He says, no, Abdullah, please come and see me. I had applied for a university requisition to go and travel to, the, to UCT for a student conference. And I didn't realize that without my student uh, registration, I couldn't go. So anyways, I went to his office. I then opened up to him and I'll never forget the day. He didn't need to do this, but he did it. He took me by my hand. He walked me to the fees office. He arranged an SPAS loan for me. And from that day, my marks went the other way. And for wow. me, somebody backed me. Somebody believed in me. Somebody stood by me. And I often say we need each other in this country. We need each other to be able to understand your story and your background. And so, you know, when I went into the legal profession, my third year, my fourth year, and my master's, which I did cum laude, was great because I could focus on my studies. And I'm, I'm currently doing the Harvard GMP uh, which is also brilliant. I mean, to uh -huh. learn, to be a student, uh, to do it because COVID has allowed me to do it online uh, and also to be currently doing my PhD it has been great to come full circle because I was almost on the edge of not making it and not because of intellect, but because of finance. Wow. So what taught me how to research, uh, but I, yeah. I, I find that working in consulting and you'll know this, Dudu, is like uh, dog years, right? One year is like seven years. You get yeah. to learn about industries and networks. And so... It's been a good grounding, but I've moved quite significantly into another space. Gosh, that is an amazing story. Um, yeah, I'm even more inspired. I mean, you've always inspired me. Now seeing this other side of you uh, and understanding your journey, what is your unique value proposition? What makes you memorable in a space when you occupy it? So I think, uh, you know, the feedback I got from me, I get from many clients all the time is one, Abdullah, you have a unique ability to be able to walk into our company, into our organization. You have the ability to knit things together in a beautiful way, but you have the ability to put us onto the balcony for us to get the bigger picture, for us to understand that strategy is not a piece of uh, uh, words strung together. It's not a hundred page PowerPoint document. It's really the ability to understand our why and to have the tough but frank and honest and authentic conversations around the why, and then to take the decisions in terms of what are we going to do with that why to be able to add value. So I think that's the one. 
I think the second one is, uh, and what I love doing, and uh, you know, it's something that uh, feeds my passion is to stand in front of the classroom and to be able to teach, whether it be on executive programs or on our MBA. And when something drives you from a passion perspective, you spend hours and hours in your craft and the ability to think about how am I going to frame a case? I talked yeah. this morning to a mixed group of individuals from different companies in an open program at Gibbs. And what I loved about, you know, I woke up early this morning and I've got this routine where when I'm uh, delivering something, whether it be a talk or whether it be a class or whether it be a strategy session, I wake up early that morning and I'm in the zone of that client. And it comes automatically. And I find that that is a skill set that hasn't come because I've written it down or codified it. It just happens naturally. Yeah. And uh, so I, I've loved that part of the work that I do. I also love that my work gives me the ability to build a network and to be able to string together and piece together people who are in otherwise outside worlds of each other and to bring them together. And so it's something I want to work very strongly on in the next five years. How do I bring people with similar interests, with similar passion, with similar areas of expertise to try and maybe work more collaboratively together. Uh, but yeah. I think that's, that's a major area. It's the ability to think strategically, to get the big picture, to connect the dots and to bring people together. Yeah, and just to grip them. I mean, whenever you present um, and you, you – I had the privilege, I think, of two, three years ago when we were doing a leadership development program and you were one of um, the presenters. And uh, so you have that ability to really hold the room. As a, a CEO um, of The Strategist, you've also authored a book titled Disruption Amplified, Reset, Rewire, Reimagine Everything. First of all, can you just explain what disruption means and what is the one wisdom you want us to draw out of, of this book? Sure. So I think disruption, as you've said, uh, Dudu, is a word that's often overused. I mean, we often overuse this word of VUCA, right? The world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And underpinning that is quite a bit of disruptive elements in the world. And I argue that disruption has four or five important under elements that we have to speak about. The first one is the massive increase in terms of the access and the utilization of technology. So think back when mobile phones came out they were used in many of our cases only for sms and at best some phone calls that weren't very clear today your phone is a primary means of device in fact it's gone on to affect relationships right today you open somebody's whatsapp they get two blue ticks you don't reply they get emotional and feelings and all of these things right so mobile phones have opened up our doors where our mobile phone becomes a menu to be able to order food the mobile phone is the opportunity for you to get a card that comes to you that geolocate maps you and takes you to a destination without you saying a single word. Uh, the mobile phone gives you the ability to be able to, at the drop of a hat, become an overnight epidemiologist. Uh, I say that half chokingly, but I'm sure in all of your WhatsApp groups, those who are listening today, you have friends and family members who all of a sudden have expertise of COVID and data science and all of that, but it's democratized education, seriously. I think the fourth thing is that it's given us the ability to do things we never otherwise considered possible, to have food or to have groceries delivered to us in 60 minutes. So one, it's definitely the acceleration of digital. And this has exploded as a result of COVID because the context has changed. The second is that countries have become a lot more closer. And I think with COVID, it's going to change and we're going to see more nationalism. But in the last 10 years, we've definitely seen an increase in terms of the interconnectedness of countries. We often speak about network effects, but the best example in my view of network effects outside of platform-based businesses is the speed at which COVID traveled from what was initially a Wuhan crisis to a global crisis in a short space of five weeks. Mm -hmm. So the second is the, interconnected of the interconnectedness of the world through airline and other forms of connectivity. The third element of disruption is the fact that we've had a massive increase in terms of population. We've now got almost seven and a half billion people of which 1.2 billion live in Africa with an average age of 19.7. So we've got a young society and a sizable population. And this has been uh, a factor in the last 50 to 60 years, the rapid rise from a population perspective. And then the last two, and perhaps the very important elements, is the fact that many parts of our society have been able to get agency, the ability to hold leaders accountable, the ability to hold businesses accountable. And what comes out of that, all of this together, 
the increase in technology, the access to information, the ability to have agency or start to change the behavioral patterns, what I call in the book, the cognitive rewiring of human behavior so that your expectations start to shift. And maybe I want to use a lighthearted example, but it's a great one, is in the 90s, if you had to go for dinner, you would be able to go, you'd have to travel 25 kilometers, depending on where you stay, and you'd go to the Mike's Kitchen, the Spur, or the Wimpy. And the Wimpy wasn't even open at night, right? So if you had to go for dinner today, you're actually too lazy after you've ordered the Uber Eats to leave your couch and go to the front door and pick it up. Yeah. Uh, and if the Uber Eats driver is a bit late, you get a very upset and you send lots of emails. That's rising customer expectation. That's changing yeah. consumer behavior. So disruption is this acceleration of different forces and trends that are impacting us. One takeaway from the book that I think is necessary is this view that I argue that we all think that the underpinning disruption is technology. Yes, technology is a subset, but what I'm going to argue is that in the 10 years that we see coming ahead of us up to 2030, we're going to see the increased relevance and important importance of human connections, because anything that can't be digitized or automated is going to become so much more valuable. And I speak about these skills that we need to give more impetus to. So things like curiosity, how do you be more curious in your world, in your daily reality, in your work, in the society that you live in? How do you learn a lot more? Because the value of being able to take some of our tasks and being able to automate them means we've got more time. And that time gives us the ability to become more learning oriented in our approach. I've loved going back to university and studying at the moment. And so one of my students said to me, but Abdullah, you know this stuff. And I said, no, there's no human being in the world that can ever say he or she knows yeah. all the stuff. In fact, we have to learn every day and we learn formally, but also informally. We learn by driving new routes to work. We learn by eating different food. We learn by being empathetic about people who are different to us. We learn by reflecting on what is it that we're going to stop doing. So my point is that the biggest takeaway for me is how do you get human-only skills of with some of our curiosity and building a learning mindset? This century is an interesting century, that's for sure. It's great to be a strategist in this life. <laughs> Which emerging economy anywhere in the world is inspirational to you, despite the impact of the pandemic? What are they doing that South Africa can learn from? I'm glad you said the last part because I was going to say South Africa. Uh, for me, I'm inspired every day by this young adult that has gone through one of its most painful periods. Uh, you know, we think back and I had the privilege uh, in December and I had this by chance. I was in Umslanga with, on holiday and I needed to get a book and I had forgotten my books at home. And so I walked to a bookstore and it was one of the smaller bookstores. And uh, I picked up the book of Chris Hani's daughter and uh, I read it and I just couldn't put it down because for me, it was a telling reflection in terms of how sometimes we've actually just papered over some of the deep pain, the deep yeah. anxiety, the deep challenges that we've had in society. We've had to create a society that overnight we needed to forget, we needed to move forward. And unfortunately, you create more harm than good by papering over because the cracks start to emerge. And so I'm often enamored. I'm overwhelmed by the South African story. I think it's a beautiful story that must be told more often uh, and more inclusively. And I think it must be told in many countries around the world. We've got to yeah. write the stories of history from the right perspective. And I fear that we don't. I fear we haven't been given the opportunity to remember the past to remember the fight against apartheid, not by one or two citizens, but by the thousands who were involved in it. We've got to think about the value of a peaceful transition, but the necessity to talk about some of the deep systemic challenges that we have. So I think South Africa is a beautiful, amazing, incredibly frightening at times emerging market story um, that we've got to think about. Where can we learn from another country? The question that you asked, Dudu. I think uh, the one country that I'm often interested in and really overwhelmed by is China, right? You've got this economy, and I know it's spoken about often, but it's an economy that's moved in the last 10 years from a focus and a competitiveness on manufacturing to become a services-led economy. It's moved into becoming a high-end services-driven economy with a big emphasis on research and development, with a big emphasis in terms of growing skilled workers in the economy, with a big emphasis in terms of building an ecosystem that is relevant and contextually specific to China. 
And so I think there's so many learnings that we've got to take from there. But there are many others. Uh, I love going yeah. to Dubai, this island economy, the desert in the middle of nowhere. And today, a fascinating tourism, transport, shopping, convenience hub that's come together. Yeah, many places to learn from. What is your Achilles heel and how do you prevent it from adversely impacting other aspects of your life that make you successful? Yeah, I think one of my Achilles heel and it's something I teach in strategy, but I don't live by is I speak about strategy by asking, what do you stop doing? What are the trade-offs that are necessary for you to perform at your A game? And so I tend not to make the trade-offs and the necessary decisions in terms of saying, what am I going to stop doing? I'm a person who gets very excited by new opportunities, by trying new things, by getting involved in many different projects. And so my style and my personality is always just to jump in. And I've taken a decision to be able to say, Abdullah, be more specific in terms of what is the legacy you'd like to leave? And it's been hard because my personality is always just to jump in. I don't want a title. I don't want a position. I don't want to have a big office. I just want to get involved and roll up my sleeves and contribute in some way, whether it be a strategy project or sitting on the board of a company or teaching in a classroom or helping a business grow. Um, and I tend not to say no to many things. And so in the process, yeah. I, I have a really frenetic life. And so I've taken a conscious decision and COVID has really helped me to, to evaluate that. And so I've worked with an executive coach to say, what am I going to stop doing as an individual mm to really build that success. What am I going to start doing? And what am I going to amplify? And it's been hard, but it's a, it's a process that has really helped me in the last 12 months. And so for me, it's the gift of this crisis. It's the gift of COVID that sometimes we always talk about the negative elements. And let me yeah. be honest, it's been a painful last three months, especially mm. for us in the, in the second wave in South Africa. We all have had a very difficult period with people we've lost. But it's also been 12 months where we've really been able to do things differently. So I, I, you know, I wrote a piece the other day on LinkedIn where I said, you know, what COVID taught me is that you perform much better in decent yet comfortable clothing. Uh, you know, you don't have to wear a suit and a tie uh, to actually be at your best. I've learned yeah. from COVID that we spend a huge amount of time killing productivity. Think of time in the car, time in traffic. Um, and, you know, we as a, as a society, we're brilliant at looking at return on assets. We're brilliant at looking at return on capital, but we don't ever look at return on time, which is actually the most valuable currency. Uh, COVID has taught us the magic and the importance of human moments, meeting at a coffee shop, connecting in the corridor, bumping into somebody at a reception area. But what it's also taught us, which is what I love and I want to focus a lot more on is, is that we're incredibly adaptable to change. We're resilient as human beings through some of the most difficult times. And let me make it personal. Many of your listeners today will remember March 2020. It felt surreal, but it also felt frightening. You're wondering, how am I going to work? It's not possible to work from home. How am I going to survive this? Today, one year later, you actually have a special way in which you work. You're actually more productive, to be honest. And so what I'm saying is embrace that adaptability. Yeah. I mean, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation because I always thought this is an intimate um, platform that I want to use wisdom personified for. And uh, But you have to adapt. And people still wanted to hear these conversations. Um, we can talk forever. Um, but before we, we part, <laughs> what wisdom do you want to share with uh, people watching? Uh, what, if this was the last uh, conversation you had, what would you want humanity to, to know? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a fantastic question. I think the first, uh, Dudu, is what I've learned in the last 12 months is the fr fragility of human beings. Uh, I lost a very dear friend, a friend I grew up with back in Linville where I started this conversation at the age of 39, who was at a resort and, and passed on uh, in, in the last two months. And for me, uh, you know, he had arranged a get together of very close friends in, in November last year. And it was brilliant to have gone for that. And it was brilliant to have connected. But I don't think we do enough of that. I think we've become very transactional in society. We've become very focused on what is the return back to me, instead of watering the human moments, instead of watering the things that are most important. And so I think the one is definitely water these relationships, water the connections between family and friends and people in your circle. Uh, so that for me is the first. I think the second is to be able to appreciate 
and to be grateful of some of the privileges that we have and to be able to share some of those privileges. So I shared with you some of my story, which I don't often share, but I thought it important to be able to reflect on the fact that maybe what I do now, I never considered possible. It has come with privilege, right? Um, and that privilege is an important component because that privilege has given me the ability to be able to say, how do I pass it on to other people who might not have it? I've spoken about the pain of South Africa. It's my responsibility, it's your responsibility, it's our collective responsibility to address this pain, to find ways where in our small ways we can do something about it. So that's the second. The third one for me is uh, to spend more time with my kids and my family, my parents and my spouse and my siblings and my family members, because I think we have become so enamored by what we think and define as success, higher paycheck, higher position, bigger title, bigger car, bigger home. And in reality, you start to realize that the value of life is on the moments and the memories that we make. It's the impact and the legacy that we leave. And so the third is that. And then the fourth and something I've spoken a lot about in this session is to be curious and to learn all the time. Uh, and remember that learning is not a course. It's not a textbook. In fact, we learn less on the device than what we learn from outside. And so it's about the curiosity quotient. And then finally, I think it's to have some fun. I think we've become so serious as a society and uh, it's to enjoy the, the little parts of our day and our lives because it's these small moments uh, that get us to appreciate what we do and how we do it and perhaps the importance of not to take life too seriously. Yeah, that's amazing. That's great. Um, but also, I think with the losses that we're experiencing, um, just to take moments to really connect with people, uh, not always the people that we're comfortable with. Uh, it's always amazing when you strike conversation, um, how much we learn. And that is part of the message that I'm trying to share, that wisdom comes. It sometimes happens that uh, you find it in an intelligent person, but it's not always the case. And I think you are one of those human beings that, both wise and intelligent, and it's a, a, an amazing combination. Thank you so much for giving the time to, to have this. And can you understand why we're having this conversation? Um, I am so privileged to have uh, Abdullah in our sphere <laughs> as a country, but also in my sphere as a friend as well. Uh, until next time, Wisdom Personified Conversations with Dudum Swami. Click that button, hey, subscribe and the notification so that you are the first one to know. <laughs>